This episode of Making a Chef is brought to you by Broadcast Media Group is a full-service production company with a team of storytellers who create commercials, promos, web-based videos, and more. For more information about Broadcast Media Group, go to www.getbmg.com or call 662-324-2489. Video Magic One transfers home videos, tapes, and photos into DVD, CD, or digital files. For more information, go to www.videomagicone.com or call MUW Culinary Institute in Columbus. Now, this is the first and only four-year culinary program in the States. Today, they're gonna show me around, talk to me about culinary school, and teach me some new dishes. Hi, Chef. Hi, Mark. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. I've heard a whole lot about this program. I can't wait to take a tour. We are excited to have you. Ready to get started? Yes, ma'am, I Let's am. Let's go. So can you tell me a little bit about what y'all have here in this program? Well, we have a lot of things that may be a little different from the traditional college campus. We have teaching kitchens, we have demonstration kitchens, but I think I'll start you off first in the walk-in. Okay. You didn't bring a jacket, are you sure you're ready? I think I'll be fine today. Okay. Okay, Mark, this is our walk-in cooler. You can just walk in and grab anything you need for a recipe. The students, when they come in, they'll either have a tub that's labeled for whichever class they're in, but then all the other traditional produce, dairy, meat, we just all have it separated on different shelves. The other thing I asked them to check is the temps. They have these posted and so it'll tell us if anything drops below and is in the temperature danger zone, which is not good. After the students leave here, they're gonna go on to the teaching kitchen to prepare their recipes for the day. Oh wow, this is a awesome kitchen. Thanks, we like it. We've got this area here where the instructor may come over and do a demo for the students, maybe show them how to fabricate a chicken. Then on this area over here, we've got the individual stations where the students will come, maybe individually or maybe in groups. Over here, they've got the grill area and the fryers. And then it continues on under ventilation. And on this side, we actually have an indoor smoker Ooh, and an altar cool. sham. That's yeah. cool, I like the smoker. This is our baking area. So here we've got a proof box. That's fancy. Yeah, from there it'll go on into our convection ovens. These both have convection fans, so it keeps and browns things really nicely. Yeah. This is also under a vent because everything's gas powered. Uh -huh. Then they, over here, a lot of times these wood tables, they look rough, but they are the best thing to roll out dough. Yeah, I can imagine. I can yes, imagine. and so you can see how much we go through. This is flour? All the different types of flours. We have high gluten That's bread nice. flour, all purpose and cake flour. That's a lot of flour. So depending on what they're making that day. Yeah. This is our high gluten bread flour. We order 50 pound bags of flour. Okay, Mark, this is our demo kitchen. Okay. Short for demonstration. And yeah. that's exactly what we usually do in here. So can you tell me a little bit about the culinary history of this program? Sure. Um, well, you know, MEW's been around since 1884. Wow. And we were a women's college. Mm -hmm. And eventually, in 1982, we allowed guys to start coming to MEW. Well then, the culinary program was born in 1996. And so we're gone 21 years, and it's been a thrill. You know, for people aspiring chefs, would you recommend culinary school? I do, and the reason that I say that is because you're gonna get a lot of your basic skills in culinary school. You're gonna fine tune them and polish them once you're out in the industry. And I recommend for students to always do an internship, work with as many chefs as you can. Everybody's got their own techniques. So it's fun that you mention it because one of the uh, you know main points of the show is I'm trying to go around and learn from as many different chefs, artisans, taking as many skills as I can. That is great, and since you say that, you know, we are a culinary school, and uh -huh. we focus on classic French cuisine. Wow. I actually have some ingredients in the kitchen we might be able to throw together. We're about to go cook? I think we should go cook. I'm ready. All right, let's go. Okay, Mark, I know we had talked about a little classic French cuisine today, so I thought we might make some beef bourguignon. 
I've never made this dish before, but I know a little bit about it. It's a stew, right? It is. It's basically a beef stew that's braised in a red wine, and it's from the Burgundy region in France. So we used a Burgundy wine today. Now, in France, they use an unsmoked, cured bacon. Okay. We don't have that here in the U.S., so we have traditional bacon? smoked bacon. And we won't have to use the whole thing. I did freeze it. It just makes it so much easier yes. when you're having to dice it up. So if you want to, you could just cut this in half and use, we could use about half of that in our dish. And while you're starting on that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn your stove top here on and get okay. this pan hot for you. Okay, how big of strips do you want? I would think we would probably need to do pretty small because you want to get as much of the fat rendered out of there as possible. Okay. And I'm just gonna add just a little bit of olive oil in the bottom of your pan. Okay, so about how long does this dish take to cook? Because I know braises take a while. It does, and it depends on the, the beef you're using. We're gonna use a rump roast today. Okay. Uh, it's very, very lean. So we're looking at probably, by the time we get everything assembled and put it in the oven, maybe three hours. Three hours, okay. So how versatile is this dish? Like, what can you substitute? What do you kind of have to leave there? Well, the first thing that I thought of when I heard that you like to hunt is venison, because yes, all these earthy flavors that are in this dish, I mean, you're gonna have carrots and onions and mushrooms, and then venison's a very lean meat, so if you're using that, it's perfect for a braise. Sounds good. And then the bacon's gonna add that fat that's naturally yes, missing from venison. All right, just dump them in the pan? Yeah, let's try to crumble them up a little bit. This should give us nice, nice bit of fat to start with. Oh, yes. And what's really neat about this, you know, we're gonna cook our bacon and let it get crispy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're gonna use this slotted spoon to take it out. And we're gonna use those bacon drippings to sear off our beef, to sear all our vegetables. So even though the traditional recipe doesn't call for bacon, why would you not use it? Because, you know, the smoke gives it an extra layer of flavor. It gets a nice crispiness. So. It really does. While we're waiting on that, why don't we look at this beef real quick. Okay. That's just a rump roast. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying, nice and lean. Yeah, and it's so pretty and lean, but all of them are gonna have that fat cap there. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna wanna do is use your boning knife, and we're just gonna cut that fat cap off okay. and out. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, this is a big old fat cap. It kinda reminds me of brisket. It really does, yeah. And we won't be wasting any because we'll be able to trim yes, a few big chunks out of this as well. Yeah, I could see why this would take a couple hours to become tender. Oh, yeah. So you said this comes from the Burgundy region of France? It does, and they're known for their wines, just like the Bordeaux region is also well known. I don't know my wines too well, so. You'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing you'll notice, like this, the rump roast, you can see how the meat, yes, the muscle the runs and the grain in this one. So when we get ready to cube this, with burning oil, it doesn't have to be cut into small cubes like stew. You can do larger. Julia Child always did. She did a huge, like a two inch wow. chunk. Yeah. But since we don't want to wait that long to be able to eat, it might cook a little faster if we do the, the smaller one inch chunks okay. with this. Your grain's running this way, so I would probably just cut. right down the middle. I mean, that's a perfect size. A lot of recipes, since this is using bacon here, they'll actually blanch their bacon and boil it a few mm -hmm. minutes before they saute it, just to kind of get some of that extra smoke flavor out of it. Mm -hmm. But I like it in mine. And we just want to dry it really well, because meat, if it's not dry when you go to sear it, you're basically steaming it. It's yeah. not going to get a really pretty crust on it. So we want to be sure we get this really good and dry. And we'll just add it to your bowl here. And there's a couple of other methods. Some, you sear your meat, and then you might just use like a tablespoon of flour over the top. Mm -hmm. Kind of make yourself a roux. I like to just take my flour and just sprinkle it over the beef yes, in the bowl, and then just toss it around. It gives it a good even coat of the flour. Okay, so. Next step is we are gonna take the bacon out of your pan with okay. the slotted spoon, and we're just gonna kind of move it to the side. All right, put it right here? We can, yeah, let's try that first. So we're gonna use this as a garnish at the end, or? Yes, it is garnished with some little, pretty little pearl onions, mm -hmm. um, mushrooms, and then the bacon. Sounds delicious. That is a good combination. And fresh parsley, yeah. Yeah. 
Now we've got that bacon flavoring right there. Okay. We're fixing to sear our beef, All right. and it's gonna go in there, and we wanna do just a single layer. That bacon fat's gonna make it brown, it's gonna make it taste good. Yeah. And it's gonna carry, the beef will then carry some of the bacon essence into the stew when we get yeah. ready for that. So why do you only just do a single layer of beef, not just dump it all in? Well, if you crowd it too much, it's not gonna brown evenly, and it kinda cools your pan down a little too fast. You wanna maintain that good hot temperature when you're getting ready to sear it. And we'll just keep rotating, we'll let it get nice and brown on one side, and then just keep rotating until all the sides are brown. And then when we get that out of there, we'll take them out, and then we'll just add it to this larger stock pot over here. And this is one that's gonna be safe to go in the oven, and it's yeah. really heavy, it's got a, a heavy bottom, so it's yeah. gonna cook evenly. So if I'm not mistaken, this brown stuff on the bottom is called spawn, correct? It is, it is. And we're actually gonna use some beef stock in just a minute. After we get everything brown, we're gonna deglaze that pan and get all those really good bits on the bottom. Good, yeah, that's, that's all flavor right there. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is a good winter food because it uses A, like a lot of root vegetables, B, it's hearty, and it helps clear out your fridge for especially the holidays. It really does. And a lot of times if you have a larger group, if you're needing to prep and maybe you have a lot of things going on, this is something you could even do all of your prep, you could brown your meat. I mean, it could technically go in a crock pot yeah. on low. Not for an extended period of time because you want to keep the texture of your meat. Mm -hmm. But it could stay in there to kind of free up your oven space if you've got some other things yeah. going on. Oh yeah, that's a lot of fond on the bottom. Oh yeah. Nice and flavorful. All right, there's all the meats. Let's look at some veggies. I know it's not called for. I like doing some shallots, a couple okay. of shallots, maybe half that onion, and then a couple of carrots. And you can tell me what shape you would like. Usually it's just small enough, you know, where it'll cook evenly and you want them all close to the same size. We can go ahead and get these yeah, cooked that's, that's off nice just a hot. little bit. Oh yeah, it is hot. So you want a large dice, a fine dice, a mince? You can just do a large rough chop on those. That's fine, yeah. Sounds good to me. So when possible, do you try to use uh, fresh and local vegetables? I do, I do. We have so many great farms in this area. People should really try to use and, and support them as much as they can. It gives you a much better product and it's consistent. Hey, it can just go in there on top of your carrots and stir that around a little bit. All right, we'll let those go for about five minutes on low heat. One other thing we could do, and it's a great flavoring technique, is we could do an onion pique to drop into our stew, and that way we can just pull the whole thing out instead of having to try to strain yeah. it. So with that, I usually just cut off this end, and I, I trim the root, but I leave it to where it can still, still stay attached. You've got a half an onion, you've cleaned it and trimmed it, we've got some bay leaves and some cloves. So all we're gonna do is when you flip this over, and you can use one large one, or if you've got two smaller bay leaves, you mm -hmm. can do them like this, however much. And this is a pretty big pot of stew, so we could definitely go with two. And then you just take these cloves, oh. and you're gonna pierce <laughs> your onion. And it holds your bay leaves on there, so at the end of the day, you're not having to Fish around. Go in there and fish out the bay leaves. So we're gonna hold on to that and use wow. it. I've never seen that done before. It's a really neat way to, to flavor up your sauces and soups. We're gonna do a bouquet garni, right. which again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this leek and we're gonna cut it off right here first. And we've washed it because these things are notorious yeah. for being full of dirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we're gonna take that and split it in half. Split it in half. There we go. Okay, so if you wanted to do a bouquet garni, okay. you can use both halves or you can just use one to, to kind of sandwich it together, but you're gonna build a flavor profile. We've got some fresh thyme, okay. so you could take you know, a couple of sprigs of thyme, okay. and then we have some curly parsley, Italian parsley, and we also have some flat leaf. Let's just lay it like that. Yeah, we're gonna sandwich it together and then we're gonna tie them off okay. with some of this twine. And I have some here that's cut off. It may not be big enough for All you. Right. I'll let you try it and see. If we had had a, a really long string on that and we could tie it, then you can, when you drop it in later, we'd be able to tie it to the handle of our pot. Yeah, and okay. at the end, we just pull it out. Yeah, slide that through. We're gonna toss the onions and carrots over in here with our meat. All right. 
Oh yeah, all that beautiful flavor. If it gets too dark and you think it might have a scorch flavor, we wouldn't want to use it. Yeah. But if it's okay to use and you don't have a scorch smell, we can take that beef stock right okay. there and pour, you know, about a cup of that in there and then we can scrape that off the bottom and get all that flavor. Okay. We're gonna reduce that. It's gonna come from that pan in here on top of your beef. All right, I think you're ready. Let me cut that heat off and it can go over here. There you go. We're gonna try to get our meat in an even layer. In an even layer. Okay. Yeah. And that turned out to be about the perfect size pot for this yeah. dish. Mm -hmm. So what we can do now is we can add the burgundy wine. Okay. This is what's gonna make it the beef bourguignon. With that, you put in just enough to where it covers your meat and then we're gonna get it up to a simmer. Okay. We're also gonna add that tablespoon of tomato paste. That's another level of flavor that's going into this dish. So this sounds like a very versatile recipe. It is Just very use versatile. whatever you have on hand. So. Yes. So we can go ahead and put that in there. You could have that over here. It's gonna just kinda be a little raft. It's gonna be floating on top. Okay, and then your, yeah, onion PK, and then you kinda, if you wanna flip him face down, yeah, that way your bay leaves can actually get in that liquid. There we go. All right, another really important flavor in this is gonna be garlic. Do you love garlic? I love garlic. I love garlic. Okay, we're gonna let this come up to a simmer. We're okay. gonna put this nice heavy top on it. It's gonna go into a 300 degree oven for a couple of hours. Sounds good. All right, chefs, so I see some fresh vegetables up here. So what we've got here are some little pearl onions, and these are the fresh ones. So they're just like, you know, a big onion. They've got this dried stuff yeah. on there. I need you to take that whole bowl, and I need you to peel all of those, and then we're gonna use them. I see we some, have some ours peeled over here. Can we just yeah. use these? Actually, these things, if you did want to use these, all you could do is drop them in a bowl of water, <laughs> cut the ends, they'll shoot right out, and this is what we'll have. So I was not gonna make you do okay. all those. good. These are gonna be some baby portabellas. Baby portabellas. Or creminis, yeah. Okay. And we're just gonna quarter those because it's gonna make them about the same size as what you sliced up your carrots. Okay, chef, that is a decent amount of mushrooms. Yes. All right, we're gonna heat that pan back up. Okay. Add a little bit of oil, a couple pats of butter. Butter. And we're gonna start off probably browning our little pearl onions first. We just want just a little bit of color on there. All right, these are nice and caramelized. What should we do next? Yes, gorgeous color on those. So we're gonna actually take those out of the pan, set them over here. We're gonna okay. hold them because we're gonna garnish with those. Okay. They're gonna go in in a couple of hours when that stew comes out of the oven. Okay. All right, and we're gonna do the same one with the mushrooms. So if you need a little oil, you can. We'll let them cook, you know, five, 10 minutes. Oh, these are nice oh, and caramelized. Those are beautiful. So should I put them back yeah, in? Yeah, let's put them in a different bowl. All right. All right. Now we play the waiting game. Yes. So it's been a couple hours. Uh, would you say it's time to take it out? I think we should at least check it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it smells amazing. I think we can probably go ahead and take out our bouquet garni oh. and our onion pique. Yeah, it's gonna be nice. <laughs> it's this a whole lot easier than having to try to fish all that stuff out. <laughs> Oh, and see how that onion just completely yeah. fell apart? It does still look kind of soupy. What we may want to do before we add that, maybe we need to turn the heat on up here. Okay. Let's try this trick. It's called a bourmonier. Basically, it's equal parts butter and flour. Mash that in together, and so once we put this in here, the flour's gonna thicken your sauce, butter's gonna make it taste good, and the butter's also gonna keep your flour from making lumps. Yeah. So what's this called again? A bourmonier. Bourmonier. You know, when it gets really good and incorporated and you've got enough flour in there, all you're doing is you're gonna take these little things of butter okay. and you roll them into little pea-sized balls. And so what you can do over here, you know, it's got a pretty good simmer going. You just throw one in and then we'll let it stir. And it should help that sauce thicken up pretty quick. I feel like this is also a good excuse just to add butter oh, yes. to the dish. So the last step is just adding your onions and your mushrooms in there. Okay. Just want to cook it as little as possible. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, after they're in there, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. All right, we'll let that go about five minutes. Do you want to go try to find some plates when yeah. you're ready to plate this up? Let's go do that. Okay. Mark, you did a great job. This beef bourguignon looks delicious. Thank you. It's so beautiful. And the only thing we didn't do yet 
salt and pepper to yeah. taste at the end. So we'll just add a little bit of that. In a stew, it's always better to season at the end because all over time you might season when you have a cup of liquid, by the end you might have half a cup. Right, and it'll get super salty yeah. toward the end. And when I'm plating, as dark and rich as that looks, I want like a big, yeah. really pretty white mm -hmm. bowl. All right, while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and pick some uh, parsley. And That'd just be chop great. It up. Yeah, we will garnish it with a little fresh parsley. And we're gonna build a little height here in the center. All right, and then I'm gonna grab a ladle here. So ladle some of that really pretty sauce. Slice a little piece of bread. Put some crusty French bread on there. And your bacon. Let's do bacon first. The bacon, yeah, yes. Parsley. Gorgeous fresh parsley Boom. and some crusty French bread. So that's beef bourguignon. That is beef bourguignon. That is beautiful. Mm. Mm. I love the broth. I mean, it's earthy, it's acidic from the wine. You can taste a little bit of smokiness from the bacon, and it is a awesome, awesome stew. Absolutely, and it's you know it's not it's a little time consuming, but not mm -hmm. too difficult to make. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chef. I had such a great time, um, and I can't wait to go back to my kitchen and try out some of these techniques. Mark, you're welcome to come and join in my classes anytime. You were a great student Thank today. You. I have one other place I was wanting to show you on the tour. Okay. Follow me. Oh, is that the bus tub? Okay, Mark. This is the last stop on our tour, the dish pit. Oh. We've got to wash, rinse, sanitize air dry, and then put up. <laughs> it was so great having you today. Thank you. Thanks. Since we just got back from the culinary school where they teach you the basics, I decided why not go back and learn the basics. And that all starts with the mother sauce. One of the mother sauces I'm gonna show you how to make is my rift on Espanola. Espanola sauce is a basic brown sauce. It has tomato, it has a beef or veal stock, it has mirepoix. I like to make it as a basic brown sauce in the South. And that all starts off with drippings. I just got done cooking some meatballs in here and it had pork, it had some beef, it had some onions, it leaves a nice fond, which is basically, I think it's French for flavor, but it's all this brown stuff on the bottom, which is what we want. I'm gonna heat up my pan and while this is heating up, I'm gonna whisk in two tablespoons or so, maybe three tablespoons of flour. Um, just enough flour as I have uh, grease on the bottom. And this is gonna be our roux, which is the base of most, if not all, mother sauces. I want this roux to get a nice golden brown color and a nutty smell. I'm gonna let this roux cook for about five minutes until it's a nice light brown. Okay, this is starting to smell like brown grain. It has a nice uh, golden hue to it. So I'm gonna add about a cup or so of beef broth. You can make this homemade. Mm, I love that smell. You can make homemade beef stock or homemade beef broth, but I'm just using low sodium uh, stuff from the store and it works just fine for this application. So to my two or so tablespoons of roux, I added about a cup or so of this beef stock to it's a nice consistency. Yeah, there we go, that's what I want. I'm gonna let this cook for about two minutes or so until it's thickened up nicely. All right, this is thickened up nicely, and that's how you make an Espanola, or a basic brown sauce. Steaming all included. Another mother sauce that we're gonna make is the Volute, which is velvet in Latin, I believe. Don't quote me there. But it's just as simple, and it's super similar to the Espanola sauce. It all starts off with a roux. I'm going a little more uh, classic to like New Orleans, which uses a oil-based roux. I think the difference between an oil-based roux compared to a butter-based roux is this one probably cooks at higher heat because oil doesn't burn as quickly as butter. But it starts off similar, uh, equal parts fat and flour. Just gonna whisk, whisk those up. Now, the velouté is a clear -er sauce. It's not crystal clear, but you use uh, a lighter broth like chicken stock, um, or like a fish broth. All right, that's good consistency for me. So just as before, well, let's cook for about five minutes on medium to medium high heat till it smells like toasted, uh, toasted grain and it's lightly golden brown. All right, this is smelling nice and toasty. So I'm gonna start by adding quarter cup or so of chicken broth. Just incorporated it all in. 
reduce the heat to the low. The chicken stock just provides, you know, a nice chickeny flavor. Uh, so with this, you can do so many things. You can put it right over just vegetables. If you want to, you put it over chicken. You can add some lime juice. You can brighten it up. That's one of the great things about stuff like this. It's just, it's your base of everything. I mean, you can even probably make chicken noodle soup out of this. This is done. So to go with the velouté sauce, I have some fresh avocado. I'm just gonna leave it plain. I have, I'm gonna saute up some mushrooms and blister some tomatoes and might even throw a little chicken in there. Just like a quick little light dish to go with. This is just a good example of how if you can master the mother sauces, it can take your cooking to the next level. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and check us out on Facebook and Instagram.